These servicemen and women may succeed in giving up cigarettes, or they may not. I ask you why you're not wearing a seatbelt? <laughs> you realize you're breaking the law. The 1980s were a period of bold initiatives and unconventional ways of living. It was a time when people not only accepted but fully embodied daring decisions and a willingness to take risks. The era saw recreational activities that pushed limits and provided a haven for thrill seekers. So join us on this thrilling adventure as we unveil 20 dangerous things everyone did in the 1980s. It's a pitiful sight. Hospital patients forced out onto the street, workers braving heat waves, rain and cold, just to take a puff. In the 80s, a prevalent practice involved smoking indoors and in public spaces with individuals unaware of the potential harm it could inflict. Smoking was deemed acceptable in restaurants, offices, and even on airplanes. Bad news for Air Canada passengers who smoke. More smoke-free flights have been announced by the national air carrier. The risks associated with inhaling secondhand smoke, which can result in health issues, were not well understood. Non-smokers in particular were unwittingly exposed to these hazards as the consequences were not widely recognized. Smoking indoors was a commonplace occurrence, observable everywhere. However, the impact of the smoke extended beyond the immediate smoker to affect those nearby. In that era, people had little awareness of the harmful effects of secondhand smoke. It was a time when smoking was a part of everyday life, and the risks, especially for non-smokers, were not widely recognized. Before the new law came into force, only about four out of every ten motorists regularly used a seatbelt. Back in the 80s, a considerable number of individuals did not consistently fasten their seatbelts while in vehicles. Regulations regarding seatbelt usage were less stringent, and not everyone recognized its significance. The comprehensive understanding of how wearing seatbelts could significantly enhance safety during accidents was not widespread at that time. The idea of fastening seatbelts wasn't as common, and some thought it was an unnecessary hassle. Unlike today, where we know that seatbelts are like personal bodyguards in a car, protecting against sudden stops or crashes, the 80s had a more relaxed attitude. It wasn't unusual to find drivers and passengers cruising without this simple safety measure, risking injuries or worse. Not using seatbelts meant that accidents could result in more severe impacts. Picture driving without a seatbelt like riding a roller coaster without a safety harness. Everything might seem okay until a sudden turn or drop occurs. People didn't realize the potential dangers, and it took time for society to understand that clicking that seatbelt could be a lifesaver not just a bothersome accessory. There was not as much emphasis on the serious risks associated with drunk driving in the 80s. Stricter rules and widespread awareness campaigns were not as common, allowing a more relaxed attitude toward operating vehicles under the influence of alcohol. Any attempt to restrict drinking and driving here is viewed by some as downright undemocratic. The public perception of driving while intoxicated was not as disapproving as it is today. During this era, individuals were not fully informed about the severe consequences of impaired driving. The understanding of how alcohol impairs judgment, coordination, and reaction time was not as widespread. Consequently, people were more likely to engage in this dangerous behavior without fully grasping the potential harm it could cause to themselves and others on the road. The absence of stringent regulations and comprehensive educational efforts meant that many individuals did not appreciate the gravity of the situation. This contributed to a higher frequency of accidents and increased the likelihood of tragic outcomes resulting from driving under the influence during the 1980s. Sunscreen lotions, sun-sensitive people can get out in the sun, but in the water, their sunscreens can wash off. Many individuals engaged in sunbathing without applying sunscreen, unaware of the risks associated with UV exposure. The understanding of the connection between unprotected sun exposure and skin cancer was not widespread during the 80s. Sunbathers sought a tan without recognizing the potential harm to their skin. The absence of protective measures left people vulnerable to the harmful effects of ultraviolet rays. Skin cancer, a consequence of prolonged sun exposure, was not well publicized, contributing to a lack of awareness. The absence of sunscreen usage during sunbathing sessions in the 1980s meant that individuals inadvertently exposed themselves to health risks, leading to an increase in skin-related issues in later years. 
The promotion of sun safety practices, including sunscreen use, has since become a crucial aspect of public health education. Believe the risks were only with sunbathing without sunscreen? Hold on tight as we dive into another whirlwind of memories that'll make you wonder, did we actually do that? Hey, is that chocolate? Yeah. Hop in. Back in the 80s, hitchhiking was a common practice, with people accepting rides from strangers or offering rides to unknown individuals. During this time, there was a general acceptance of this form of transportation, despite its inherent dangers. Many were unaware of the potential risks associated with getting into a car with someone they didn't know. The lack of caution in hitchhiking could lead to unsafe situations for both the hitchhiker and the driver. The social norms of the time downplayed the possible hazards, and people were more trusting of strangers. This widespread acceptance of hitchhiking without a clear understanding of the potential dangers created situations that could be risky and unpredictable. Over time, societal perspectives have shifted and hitchhiking has become less prevalent due to increased awareness of safety concerns associated with accepting rides from unfamiliar individuals. During the 1980s, the use of tanning beds gained popularity without adequate oversight, exposing users to potentially harmful levels of ultraviolet radiation. At that time, there was insufficient regulation and understanding regarding the associated health risks. Many individuals sought a desirable tan without employing proper precautions or recognizing the potential harm. Tanning beds, often found in salons, emitted UV rays that could contribute to an increased risk of skin cancer. The Food Drug Administration has proposed banning minors from using indoor tanning beds. This move is unprecedented. Its aim is to control what the experts are calling now a skin cancer epidemic that's caused by UV exposure. The absence of stringent guidelines and awareness campaigns allowed the widespread use of these beds without emphasizing the importance of protective measures. Users, unaware of the potential dangers, subjected themselves to prolonged sessions under UV light, inadvertently putting their skin health at risk. This lack of regulation and information highlights a period when the potential hazards of tanning beds were not fully comprehended, underscoring the importance of informed decision-making in matters of personal health and well-being. Make sure your child is buckled into a car seat properly. Holly Wagner lost her son in a crash due to a mistake she says many parents are making. Safety standards for baby cribs and car seats were not as strict in the 80s as they are today. This meant that the products designed to protect infants and children were often lacking in essential safety features, increasing the potential risks for young ones. Baby cribs constructed with less stringent guidelines posed dangers due to design flaws and inadequate materials. Similarly, car seats lacked the sophisticated safety mechanisms we have now, potentially putting children at higher risk during transportation. Parents unknowingly used these less secure cribs and car seats unaware of the potential hazards. This lack of awareness and regulation could result in injuries or, in more severe cases, tragic outcomes. Modern advancements in safety standards have significantly improved the protection these products offer, highlighting the importance of staying informed and adapting to evolving safety measures for the well-being of our children. If you followed any number of stories about asbestos and its role with cancer, deaths, and health problems over the years, you might think it's been banned from use in the United States. In the 80s, the construction industry commonly employed asbestos in building materials without a full comprehension of its harmful nature. Asbestos, a naturally occurring mineral, possesses insulating properties and fire resistance, making it an attractive choice for various applications. Regrettably, its microscopic fibers, when released into the air, can cause severe health issues, particularly respiratory conditions and cancer. Back then, there was a widespread lack of awareness regarding the adverse health effects linked to asbestos exposure. Consequently, buildings, schools, and homes were constructed using asbestos-containing materials. These structures unknowingly harbored a potential health hazard, as inhaling asbestos fibers can lead to debilitating diseases such as asbestosis and mesothelioma. Only with time did society grasp the importance of avoiding asbestos use, prompting stricter regulations and a shift towards safer construction materials to protect the well-being of occupants. 
A child who is eating paint can die, can become blind, mentally retarded for life. Many homes were adorned with paint containing lead, a substance now recognized as harmful, particularly to young children. Back then, the potential risks of lead exposure, especially its impact on developing minds, were not widely understood. Lead-based paint was extensively used to coat walls and surfaces throughout residences. As children explore their surroundings, they unknowingly ingest lead dust or chips, leading to serious health consequences. The absence of stringent regulations meant that households remained unaware of the lurking danger. In retrospect, the prevalence of lead-based paint in homes during this era represents a significant oversight in public safety with repercussions that were not fully realized at the time, affecting the health and well-being of those exposed. Perhaps you were not exposed to lead-based paint in residences, but have you dealt with mercury exposure? The Environment Ministry says 41% of the population have dangerous levels of the neurotoxin in their bodies. In the 80s, people commonly dealt with mercury, a substance found in household items like thermometers, without recognizing its toxic nature. Mercury, when mishandled, can release vapors that are harmful to health. Casual exposure to these vapors, often during the cleanup of broken thermometers, puts individuals at risk of mercury poisoning. The lack of widespread awareness regarding the dangers of mercury handling resulted in inadequate precautions. Mercury exposure can lead to various health issues, affecting the nervous system, kidneys, and other organs. Despite its potential harm, the precautions necessary to minimize risks were not well communicated. This lack of awareness contributed to situations where individuals, unaware of the hazards, engaged in the careless handling of mercury-containing items inadvertently exposing themselves to the associated health dangers. The broader understanding of mercury's toxicity and the need for cautious handling has evolved, prompting better practices and increased safety measures in handling such materials today. Playgrounds in the 1980s often featured equipment made of robust metals situated over hard concrete surfaces. The lack of shock-absorbing materials and safety measures increased the likelihood of injuries during play. The equipment, while sturdy, lacked modern safety features that could mitigate the impact of falls or accidents. Children engaging in play were exposed to heightened risks due to these inadequacies in design and safety standards. The absence of protective surfaces beneath play structures meant that falls could result in more severe injuries. Parents and caregivers were not as informed about the potential dangers posed by the playground environment leading to a higher acceptance of these conditions. Overall, the prevalent playground setups in the 1980s inadvertently increased the vulnerability of children to injuries during their recreational activities. Did you survive the wild and adventurous ride of the 80s? Well, hold on tight because there's more hazardous activity coming your way. Riding bicycles without helmets was the norm in the 80s. At that time, people were not widely aware of the crucial role helmets play in protecting the head during accidents. The understanding of the importance of head protection while cycling was not as prevalent as it is today. Helmets designed to absorb impact and reduce the risk of head injuries were not commonly worn. This lack of awareness contributed to an increased susceptibility to head injuries in cycling accidents. The absence of a protective barrier made individuals more vulnerable to severe consequences, emphasizing the need for education and a shift in cultural norms surrounding bicycle safety practices. The evolution of attitudes toward helmet usage has since significantly improved, highlighting the importance of ongoing efforts to promote safety in recreational activities. Household products and medications were often not child-proofed in the 80s. Common items were not adequately secured, making it easier for children to access potentially hazardous substances. Safety caps and child-resistant packaging, now standard, were notably absent. This absence of preventive measures heightened the risk of accidental poisonings among children who, due to their natural curiosity, could easily open containers containing harmful substances. The oversight in childproofing meant that parents and caregivers had to exercise extra vigilance to prevent unintentional exposure to medications and household chemicals. 
The 1980s marked a time when the importance of securing these products to safeguard children's well-being was not fully recognized, leading to increased incidents of accidental ingestions and poisonings. Not only was there a deficiency in child-proofing measures for medication and household products, but there was also a notable absence of stringent regulations regarding the safety of toys. But a warning for parents tonight, we're finding this Fisher-Price toy could be putting your children in real danger. In the 1980s, there were not as many rules to ensure that toys met safety standards. Some toys had small pieces that could be easily swallowed, posing a choking hazard for children. Additionally, certain toys contained materials that could be harmful if ingested or touched. The absence of strict regulations meant that manufacturers were not obligated to adhere to rigorous safety guidelines, potentially putting children at risk. Parents and caregivers had limited information about the potential dangers associated with certain toys, making it challenging to make informed choices. As a result, children were exposed to potential hazards during playtime, and the lack of stringent oversight on toy safety contributed to preventable injuries and health concerns in younger individuals. There was limited awareness regarding the prolonged effects of concussions in sports back in the 80s. Athletes, especially in contact sports, often continue playing after experiencing head injuries without undergoing proper evaluation and treatment. The understanding of how repeated concussions could lead to serious health complications was not widespread, Protocols for recognizing and managing head injuries were less established, exposing athletes to unnecessary risks. Coaches, players, and medical professionals didn't fully grasp the potential long-term consequences of these injuries. The prevailing attitude favored playing through pain, contributing to a culture where protecting athletes' brain health wasn't adequately emphasized. This lack of awareness resulted in athletes unknowingly jeopardizing their future well-being by downplaying or disregarding the significance of concussions in the pursuit of immediate athletic goals. Using garden hoses for drinking water was commonplace, yet this seemingly innocuous practice had hidden risks. The materials in these hoses could release potentially harmful chemicals into the water, unbeknownst to many. Unfortunately, there was a lack of awareness regarding the potential contaminants leading to unsafe water consumption practices. Garden hoses, primarily designed for outdoor use, were not intended for delivering potable water. The casual use of hoses for drinking water meant that individuals were inadvertently exposing themselves to substances that could have adverse health effects. The absence of proper information about the materials used in hoses and the potential leaching of chemicals underscored a significant oversight in water safety during that era. This lack of awareness highlights the importance of understanding the suitability of materials for specific purposes to ensure the safety of daily practices, such as obtaining water from hoses. Used right, it is absolutely harmless to humans and animals, but to insects, it is deadly. In the 1980s, there was widespread use of pesticides like DDT in agriculture. Back then, we didn't fully grasp the consequences of these chemicals. Farmers aiming to protect crops from pests employed these substances without a complete understanding of their environmental and health impacts. DDT and similar pesticides posed risks to both the soil and water. The residues from these chemicals could linger in the environment, leading to unintended contamination. This lack of awareness meant that practices intended to ensure crop productivity inadvertently introduced harmful elements into ecosystems. The long-term effects of exposure to these pesticides on human health and the environment became clearer over time. Today, with enhanced knowledge and more stringent regulations, we recognize the importance of careful pesticide use to mitigate adverse impacts on both agricultural practices and the delicate balance of ecosystems. Wondering what else made the 80s a truly outrageous time? The next revelation about this extraordinary era will leave you astonished. During the 1980s, awareness and testing for radon gas in homes were minimal. Radon, a colorless, odorless gas, naturally emanates from the Earth's soil and rocks. Unfortunately, many households remained uninformed about its potential health risks. High radon levels indoors can lead to lung cancer, making it a serious concern. The lack of understanding and testing during this period meant that numerous homes unknowingly exposed their occupants to elevated radon levels. 
This oversight contributed to a higher incidence of lung cancer cases linked to radon exposure. Recognizing the importance of testing for radon gas and implementing mitigation measures in homes has become more prevalent in recent years. However, the limited awareness in the 1980s underscored the need for ongoing education about the potential dangers of radon to ensure the safety of residential environments. There was limited awareness regarding the health consequences of diets abundant in sugars and trans fats in the 1980s. People commonly consume sugary and processed foods without a full understanding of the potential adverse effects on health. High intake of these dietary elements contributed to a range of health issues, including obesity and cardiovascular diseases. At that time, prevailing dietary patterns lacked emphasis on the importance of balanced nutrition, and the negative impact of excessive sugar and trans fat consumption was underestimated. The absence of comprehensive information on nutritional choices led to the widespread adoption of diets that, unknown to many, posed long-term health risks and the subsequent years witnessed a gradual shift in awareness, prompting changes in dietary recommendations and guidelines to promote healthier eating habits and reduce the prevalence of diet-related health problems. With the assistance of the outside broadcast unit, we will be linking from the database studio to their home. Back in the old days, computer networks operated without robust measures to safeguard against unauthorized access and cyber threats. The understanding of digital security was in its infancy, and the concept of cybersecurity as we know it today was not fully formed. Computer systems lacked the necessary protections, making them susceptible to breaches, data theft, and malicious activities. During this period, the focus was primarily on developing and expanding computer networks, with insufficient attention given to securing these systems. The absence of comprehensive cybersecurity protocols meant that individuals and organizations were unaware of the potential risks associated with digital activities. This oversight left sensitive information and networks exposed to exploitation, emphasizing the necessity for the evolution of cybersecurity practices as technology advanced. The 1980s laid the foundation for recognizing the critical need for cybersecurity in our increasingly digitized world.